Well, good morning. Um, this morning we're going to be looking at um, Galatians chapter 5, verses 1 through 15, and you will find that on page, uh, uh, page 974 in the, in the Pew Bibles, if you have the one that looks like this, which I think is mostly, mostly what we put out today. We have a few different ones that pop up from time to time, and page numbers are a little different, but 974. And as, as you turn to that, as you find that, um, uh, I want to tell you about this this morning about sort of this, uh, it's kind of this routine, I guess is maybe the best best thing you could call it, this routine that, that Finn and I have. Um, uh, so my son Finn, most days he rides his scooter to school. Um, many of you have probably seen him ride his scooter to church. And, and so just about every day um, he rides a scooter to and from school. And so we're going down the sidewalk. He zooms out ahead of me because, you know, he can go faster on his scooter than I can walk. And so I always tell him, you know, as he goes ahead, I sort of shout out to him. I say, hey, when, when you come to a street, stop and wait for me. You know, as we go along, there's, there's plenty of cross streets. And every time he gets to a street, stop and wait for me. And I say it again to him. It's like, hey, you know, when you get to a street, stop and wait for me. And he does it. And, and when I get there, I, I always congratulate on him. You know, congratulate him on him. I'm like, yeah, good job, Finn. Good job. Thank you for stopping and waiting. Um, and then a few minutes later, we're going. And then I remind him again. You know, when you get to a street, stop. Stop and wait for me. And so if you're, if you're a parent or if you're an aunt or an uncle, if you're an older sibling or if you've done any kind of babysitting, if you've ever cared for, you know, a younger child, then, then you've probably gone through something similar to this. You, you just keep repeating an instruction. Um, because there's certain instructions that, that bear repeating. We have to say them over and over again. Even um, if the person that you're caring for seems to understand the instruction, even if they do exactly what you've asked them to do, you find yourself repeating it, right? I keep telling Finn, stop and wait. Don't cross the street until I get there. Stop and wait for me. Even when he does it, I tell him again. And so why? Why would I do that? And I normally, you know, I, I was actually talking to somebody here. I normally ask just kind of rhetorical questions up here, but, but this is a real question. Like, you can, you can shout out an answer. Why would I tell Finn again and again and again, stop and wait for me? Any thoughts? Yeah, because of the consequences, because it's really important, right? It's important that he remember that and he do it, that he do it every time um, because his life could depend on it. If he forgets and rolls out into the streets, you know, he's, you know, he's like 1.2 meters tall. Like, he, he, you know, most cars are not going to see him. So I repeat it because it's important. When something is important, that's what we do. We repeat it. And so as we, as we look at this next section in Galatians, what we see is Paul is repeating a number of things that he's already talked about in this letter to the Galatians. Um, he said a lot about freedom and slavery already, and he's going to talk more about that in this section. He's written at great length about the law and righteousness, and he's going to talk more about the law and righteousness in these verses. And so why? Why does Paul repeat these same things over and over in this letter? Why does he say them again and again? Because they're important. Because we need to hear what he's saying. The Galatian church needed to hear what Paul was saying because their lives depended on it. Our lives, our eternal lives depend on hearing what Paul has to say. The gospel that Paul has to deliver to us. When something's important, we repeat it. And so I want you to listen as, as I read through Galatians 5, 1 through 15. Listen for some of the things. Um, if you've been here in, in previous weeks, listen for the, some of the things that Paul repeats. Some of the things that we've already talked about. They're going to come up again in this passage. And so if, if you would, follow along as I read Galatians chapter 5, verses 1 to 15. For freedom... Christ has set us free. Stand firm, therefore, and do not submit again to the yoke of slavery. Look, I, Paul, say to you that if you accept circumcision, Christ will be of no advantage to you. I testify again to every man who accepts circumcision that he is obligated to keep the whole law. 
You are severed from Christ. You who would be justified by the law. You have fallen away from grace. For through the Spirit, by faith, we ourselves eagerly wait for the hope of righteousness. For in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision counts for anything, but only faith working through love. You were running well. Who hindered you from obeying the truth? This persuasion is not from him who calls you. A little leaven leavens the whole lump. I have confidence in the Lord that you will take no other view than mine. And the one who is troubling you will bear the penalty, whoever he is. But if I, brothers, still preach circumcision, then why am I being persecuted? In that case, the offense of the cross has been removed. I wish those who would unsettle you would emasculate themselves. For you were called to freedom, brothers. Only do not use your freedom as an opportunity for the flesh, but through love serve one another. For the whole law is fulfilled in one word. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. But if you bite and devour one another, watch out that you are not consumed by one another. Please pray with me. Father in heaven, we thank you for for this, your word. Lord, we pray as we, um, as we look at this text together, as we study and consider your word, that you would speak to our hearts by the power of your Holy Spirit. Father, give us ears to hear and give us hearts to believe the good news of your gospel, Jesus given for us, in whose name we pray. Amen. So, <clears throat> One of the things I was thinking about this week that just sort of came to mind as I was thinking about this text and thinking about um, how we might understand it, um, there's a phrase that came to mind that um, uh, to me is a, a pretty like iconic, maybe a pretty iconically American phrase, although I'm, I'm going to reveal in just a minute it's not actually not American at all. Um, we like to take things. Um, uh, <clears throat> but... Uh, but this phrase, live free or die. So live free or die is the state motto of the state of New Hampshire in the United States. Um, and it was first written by a general from the American Revolution, a guy named John Stark. And it's taken from a toast that, um, that he had written for uh, the reunion of this, you know, you know, this American revolutionary battle. Um, but like a lot of things that relate to the American Revolution, the phrase live free or die um, it actually comes from the French. You know, we, 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 we just sort of took it from the French. It's a, it was a popular motto of the French Revolution. And if we're honest, you know, given really the importance and the significance of French support to the American Revolution, then it, it, it kind of makes sense that something that we feel is very, very American eh, actually came from the French. Um, but we have adopted it. You know, as Americans, we have adopted this and we have made it our own. In a lot of ways, the, the sentiment of live free or die encapsulates, you know, how, how many Americans think of ourselves. It is this sort of national story that, that we believe this is who we are. It, it distills our ideas into this core ideology um, that we would rather die than live under tyranny. Um, that we will stand and we will fight to remain free, to keep our freedom. And as I was thinking about that, I, I think that that really is the essence of what Paul is saying here. Like he's talking about our freedom in Christ and what happens to us if we lose it, if we forsake it, if we give it up, we will die. Galatians 5, 1, he says, for freedom, Christ has set us free right? For freedom, for the sake of freedom, so that we can be free, Christ has set us free. Stand firm, therefore, and do not submit again to a yoke of slavery, right? Don't give up your freedom. Don't throw it away. Live free or die. The question for us really then is, well, what, what is freedom? How do we understand it? Do we really understand freedom? And then what does it mean for us as Christians in particular? What does it mean for us to live free? 
Well, Paul says that it was for freedom that Christ set us free, for the sake of freedom. For the sake of freedom, Jesus died for us. For the sake of freedom, then, we must, right, as a consequence of what Jesus has done, we must live free, free, unencumbered lives. Because Jesus has set us free, we must live for freedom. We can't go back to the burden of slavery, which means we can't live under a slavery that's imposed by others through rules and regulations and trying to be super religious people. But we also can't live in slavery to ourselves through our own passions, through our own desires, being, in effect, super irreligious people. Because Jesus has set us free, we have to live for freedom. And so what we're going to look at this morning is just two implications of what that means, two implications of what it means to live for freedom. And so because Jesus has set us free, we must not abandon freedom and we must not abuse freedom. And so first, we, we must not abandon freedom. We can't abandon freedom. That's the warning that Paul has been repeating again and again through this letter. Don't abandon the freedom you have in Christ. The purpose of the law was to point you to Jesus, was to show you how much you needed him. And so when he comes, you can't go back to the thing that pointed to Jesus. You know, it's, I mean, it would be like, um, I'm, 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 sorry, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try to do an illustration that's not in my notes, so bear with me. Um, but it would be like, you know, if you wanted to go to the McDonald's in Brentford, and you just walked and stood in front of the sign to McDonald's instead of going in, right? That, that's what the law does. The law points us to the thing. So we can't, when the thing comes, we can't go back to the sign. We need to go to the thing that it points to. And so in verse 2, Paul says, if you accept circumcision, then Christ will be of no advantage to you. Right? Christ will be of no advantage. He'll be of no use to you if you go back to circumcision, if you go back to the law, back to the sign, back to the thing that was pointing to Jesus. Why? Why would he be of no advantage to you? Well, he explains it then in verse 3 when he says, because you will be obligated to keep the whole law. And this is something he said before. We've talked about this before in reading through this letter. If you go back to any part of the law, and if you want to rely on that aspect of the law, if you want to rely on that to save you, then you have to keep the whole thing. And so why does Paul keep repeating this point? Why does he keep saying again and again, if you go back to the law, remember, if you go back to the law, you have to keep the whole thing without fail. Why does Paul keep saying that? Because it's important. Because our lives depend on understanding this point. That we can't go back to the law. We can't look to anything other than Jesus to save us. If we look honestly and seriously at, at the law's demands of what it requires, then what we should see right away is that we can't keep all of these demands, all of these requirements. <clears throat> the law then shows us the need for a savior. It shows us that we need someone who can do what we can't do. And Jesus is that someone. He's our Savior. He's the one who did what we can't do. He kept the whole law, and he did it perfectly. And he did it for us. So we can't go back to that. If we turn back to that now, if we turn back to the law now, then Christ is of no advantage. Christ is of no use to us. Because what it means is that we are rejecting Christ. We're rejecting what he did on the cross. And Paul says you can't reject Christ and then still benefit from what he has accomplished. And so Paul uses the imagery of circumcision here, and he uses it in some pretty strong ways. Um, this is one of those passages that as, you know, as a pastor, you get to it and you're like, oh, I'm preaching on this. And I have to figure out how, like in the church, to somehow be more delicate than the Bible is. Because the Bible's fairly indelicate on this point. Paul is fairly indelicate on this point. Because circumcision is about cutting away a piece of skin. It's about cutting something off of your body 
And Paul says, if you're doing this in, an or, in, in order to be saved, if you're doing this to make yourself more worthy, if you're doing this to improve on what Jesus has done, then you aren't just cutting off a bit of skin. Paul says, you're cutting yourself off from Christ. Right? You are cutting your whole person, your entire self. You are cutting yourself off from Christ. Verse 4 says, if you do this, then you are severed from Christ. And then Paul takes this even further in verse 12, and he says, I wish those who would unsettle you, right? So the people who are saying, you ought to be circumcised, I wish that they would emasculate themselves. Right, so Paul says, don't just cut off a little bit. Go ahead, go ahead and castrate yourselves. And that's an uncomfortable thing to think about. It's an uncomfortable thing to read. It's an uncomfortable thing to talk about, you know, from the pulpit on a Sunday morning. But that's what Paul says. And it's shocking. And it's shocking because the consequences are far worse. Right? What is at stake is a shocking scenario. Paul says your very salvation is at stake here. And so what would be worse? Would it be worse to make yourself a eunuch, to make yourself to where you could, you could never have children? Or would it be worse to be cut off from Christ? And so Paul uses you know, this shocking image. And, and he, I mean, he sounds angry because I think he is. He's righteously angry. These people are threatening to cut you off from Christ. And so he says, I wish that they would just completely neutralize themselves. Because Paul's saying, wake up. Don't. Don't be fooled by this. Don't cut yourself off from Christ. Don't throw away what Christ has done for you. And so Paul reminds us again and again that when we look to Christ, what we see is that his work is completed on the cross. It's finished. It's all been done. Our salvation is secure. It's, it's once and forever. We can't add anything to it. And if we try, if we try to add to what Jesus has done, then it means we're giving up Jesus. We're cutting ourselves off from him and from everything that he has done for us. And so Paul's telling us that moralism, right, this idea that, that we can somehow be super religious people and that we can add to what Jesus has done, that that is a bankrupt and futile way to live. That if we look to things we do, fulfilling some kind of system, in order to be right with God, it's bankrupt, it's empty. It's, it's not going to get us what we long for. And so there's a, a, a sitcom from the 90s called Friends. I feel like most people in this room, as long as you're above a certain age, you've, you've heard of it. And there's an episode of Friends where one of the characters, um, Phoebe, she is determined that she's going to do a genuinely good selfless deed, like a genuinely selfless good deed. Um, so this whole thing rolls out of an argument that she has with one of the other characters, Joey, who he's an actor and he gets, and he gets a job answering the telephones for like a PBS telethon, like a charity event. And so he's really excited because he says, you know, I'm getting to do a good thing and I'll get some good publicity for myself. And so she kind of, you know, and, and so she goes, well, then it's not really a good thing, right? You're getting something out of it. So it's not really a selfless good deed. And so he argues, well, there's no such thing as a selfless good deed. Anything that we do that is kind or generous or helpful to somebody else, we get something out of it. Um, so she sets out, Phoebe sets out on this mission. She's going she's gonna to find a genuinely selfless good deed. She's going to find something she can do that is genuinely selfless and good. And so she, the, one of the first things she does is she tries to rake the leaves off of her. She has an elderly next door neighbor and she decides she's going to rake the leaves off of his, his front stoop, off of like the stairs in front of his building. But he catches her. And he comes out and he thanks her and he brings her cider and cookies. And so she's really angry because she really enjoyed the cider and cookies and she felt really good about helping her neighbor. And so it wasn't selfless anymore. Um, she calls Joey and tells him that, that she let a bee sting her. And she's like, I hate it. I feel terrible. But that, v, that bee, he probably feels really great about himself. He got to look brave and cool in front of his friends. And he's like, you know, the bee probably died. And she's like, oh. And so finally, like at the end of everything, she finally finds something she can do. And so she makes a donation to the telethon. Um, and she has this whole backstory of why she hates PBS, but she gives money to it. And she doesn't like giving the money. 
and she would rather spend it somewhere else, but she gives it to PBS to help them. And so that's her selfless good deed. But her friend Joey is the one who takes the phone call. And so he ends up on camera because that pledge put them over their, their pledge total. And he gets the great publicity that he wanted all along. And so her good deed helped him and she feels really good about it. And so the whole thing is ruined. All this effort to try to do something that was selflessly good and she couldn't. The thing she thought she could do, she still felt good about it. She got something out of it. She set this criteria for herself and then she couldn't fulfill it, right? She made the rules for this thing and she still couldn't keep them. That's the dilemma of moralism is that no matter how hard we try, even if we set the rules, we're not going to be able to keep them. And so what does that look like for us? Like we're, we're not in this room, probably most of us are not contemplating, you know, Old Testament Jewish religious circumcision. Um, so what is the moralism? What is the legalism that, that creeps in for us? Where do we find our worth and our purpose? By what we do. Um, so one of the things that I, that I thought about, and this is, in some ways, this is a weird thing to talk about. I'm going to say that up front. But I thought about, you know, um, reading our Bibles and spending time in prayer, um, which are, you know, we would say those are part of the means of God's grace, right? The you know, God's word and prayer and the, and the sacraments are God's means of grace to us. It's, it's the means by which God extends his grace to us. And, and those things can help us grow closer to God. In fact, setting aside, a time, you know, setting aside time every day to, to spend time in God's word, and to spend time in prayer, these are things that can help us grow as Christians. And yet, they can become idols. They can become things that we base our worth on. That if we find our assurance in how much time we spend reading the Bible or how much time we spend in prayer or how we do it every day and we never skip a day, then what happens? What happens if you oversleep one morning and you're running late for school or you're running late for work and you just take off and you don't do it that morning? And you think, well, I'll do it in the afternoon. You get home at the end of the day and you're too tired. And you go to bed and, and you haven't done it. Or you... You know, or you wake up and, and you are just struggling mightily with, with doubt, with depression, with, with uncertainty over, um, over something in your life, and you just can't find the will to go and read your Bible and pray. Well, if your assurance of salvation depends on you keeping a perfect record of doing those things, then what you're going to be faced with is a devastating failure. Right? If you feel like your worth to God is based on what you can give to him and what you can do for him, then when you fail, and we all will fail at this, then what you're left with is a crushing failure. The world would say you blew it, and so you have to start over. You've got to go all the way back to the beginning and rebuild that track record. But that's not what the gospel says. The gospel says your salvation was never based on you keeping a perfect record. It's about Jesus. And so Bible study and prayer, like those are important things and they can help us to know Jesus better. But knowing Jesus also gives us the assurance that our salvation comes from him and not from anything that we do. And it actually gives us the strength. It gives us the courage to do these things, not because it makes us right with God, but because we have been made right with God. Right? So, so all, this, all the religious activity in the world will not make us right with God. So then does that mean that we can just do whatever we want? Right? Is, is, is that what I'm saying? Is that what Paul's saying? Is, is Paul saying, you know, well, then it just doesn't matter. It's all about Jesus, so do whatever you want. Does it matter how we live, or does freedom in Christ then give us license to sin? And that, that would bring us to our second point, that because Jesus has set us free, we must not abuse our freedom. Paul says in verse 13, don't use your freedom as an opportunity for the flesh. So in other words, freedom in Christ, it's not an excuse to sin. We can't earn our salvation by good behavior. Right? That's the first point. You can't earn your salvation by good behavior, but you also can't lose your salvation by bad behavior. But that doesn't mean that our behavior is irrelevant. If we've been saved then we are in Christ. Our lives are hidden in him. 
And that means that we should increasingly look like Jesus. Our lives more and more day by day should look more like Jesus. Now, John Calvin, who is one of the, the reformers, um, uh, he said that our hearts are like little idol factories. Um, what he means is that we continually, all the time, we take lesser things, smaller things, and we make them into ultimate things. As Christians, we can justify all kinds of destructive and harmful behaviors based on our freedom in Christ. Right? We can make excuses for, for abusing alcohol. I mean, I, 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 you know, I've heard people do this, talking about their freedom in Christ. Like in Christ, I'm, I am free to drink or not drink. And then they just tell kind of these horrible stories um, of parties, um, things that they've gone to and done, and saying it's all okay because I'm free in Christ. Or we can justify an addiction to pornography by saying, well, these are just images on a screen. And you know, the Bible says there's nothing that comes from outside of me that can defile me. Or we can be dismissive of, of anger, of verbal abuse, of, of bullying, of intimidation, of, of terrible behavior towards other people. And we can make excuses for this within the church by saying, oh, well, you know, you know, he's just a prickly person on the outside, you know, but, but once you really get to know him, he's, he's, he's actually really kind, you know, or, or that's just his personality. And so we make excuses for things in our lives that don't look like Jesus. And we say, oh, well, we have freedom. So we can, you know, this isn't what determines my salvation. And see, the thing that Paul is warning us about is that we can actually take God's grace that we don't deserve and we can't earn, and we can make that into yet another idol. We can make it into something that we focus on instead of Jesus. We can, just like we can make an idol out of our efforts to do good, we can make an idol out of our failures to do good. That's what Paul's getting at when he says in verse 6, in Christ there's neither, uh, he says, in Christ neither circumcision nor uncircumcision count for anything. In both of these things, the focus is on us. If we boast in our performance, if we boast in our good behavior, that's the idol of circumcision. That's, that's legalism. That's moralism. That's being super religious. And Paul says it doesn't count for anything because it's focused on us instead of on Jesus. And if we boast in our failures to do good, if we deny that our, that our efforts matter at all, that's the idol of uncircumcision. That's how we can take the grace of God and make it into an idol. It's an attitude that says, whatever I do or don't do, it doesn't matter. But the focus in that kind of thinking is actually still on us instead of on Christ. Because if we are unchanged by God's grace, then what we're saying is that Jesus doesn't matter. But Paul says, what matters is faith working through love. Because love changes us. We don't deserve God's grace. We don't deserve God's love. We can't earn God's grace or God's love. We can't add to it and we can't lose it. But we will always, always be changed by it. To be loved has a powerful effect on us. In human relationships, to be loved has a powerful effect on us. It changes our brain chemistry. It improves our mood. Knowing that we are loved can boost our self-confidence. It can lower our stress levels. It can make us more loving towards other people. And it, and it becomes infectious. Now take that and multiply it, multiply it by infinity. And that's the power of the love of God. It makes us more loving towards other people. Our faith works through love. What we believe works through what we've been given. And so Paul says that because we have been loved, because we have been so deeply loved, then we can in turn love one another. In fact, he says in verses 13 and 14 that the whole law is fulfilled when we love and serve one another. 
And so in doing this, Paul has actually brought us to a whole new understanding of the law. Up to this point in Galatians, right, Paul's been kind of beating on the law with a stick and saying, look, it was temporary. It was to point you for Jesus to Jesus. It actually increases your sin. Like, I mean, he, Paul's really hard on the law because he doesn't, want to, he doesn't want us to go to it as a way to be saved. But if we are in Christ, we have a new understanding about the law. If the law is about effort, then we're going to fail. We're going to blow it. But if the law is about love, that changes us. That changes everything. See, we can't keep the law. And that's why Paul says, if you want to go back to the law, you have to keep all of it. And you can't. But in Christ, we can fulfill the law. If we love one another, then we're not going to lie to each other. We shouldn't. Not if we really understand God's love. If we are really loving each other, we're not going to steal from one another. We're not going to commit adultery. We're not going to murder one another. If we love one another, we're not going to pour out our anger or our jealousy or our greed or our envy on each other. That's what Paul says is going to happen. If we don't have love, we are going to devour each other. But if we have been loved, and if we have received the love of Christ, that sets us free in a way that nothing else can. We can now live the way that we were meant to live. We can live in a way that fulfills what the law intended. That we can live in a right relationship with God and in right relationships with one another. There's a song by a band called the Soup Dragons um, that says, I'm free to do what I want any old time. And I and I saw at least one head nodding to that song. Um, and that's a tricky thing, right? Is that true? That I'm free to do what I want any old time? I think it is. I think that Paul would say it is. That the gospel of grace says, yes, you are free to do what you want any time and all the time. But the gospel of grace changes what we want, right? If we obey the law because we're trying to earn something from God, then what we want is to save ourselves. But if we've been loved, we fulfill the law because we want to live in a way that's pleasing to God. We want to spend time with our Savior. It changes what we want. When Jesus sets us free, we're able to live for freedom. We're free to ask, how can I serve my church? How can I serve my neighborhood? How can I serve my colleagues at work, my friends at school? How can I live my life in a way that points to Jesus? That shows the people around me that I love them and that they, that they have value and meaning and purpose because they're made in the image of God. How can I use my freedom to love my neighbor. That's what Paul gets at. Is that we fulfill the law when we love our neighbor as ourselves. And so I'm going to end with a, with a story about Eric Little. Um, and many of you may already know the broad story of Eric Little or all kinds of details about Eric Little. I don't know. I don't know how much y'all know about Eric Little. But he was a Scottish sprinter. Um, he won the gold medal for the 400 meter race in the 1924 Paris Olympics. Um, and honestly, it was as I was thinking about this illustrated station, uh, illustration that I realized, oh, next year's Olympics in Paris, that's 100 years. I, 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 I had not caught that before. Um, and he might have won more, except that he refused to race in events that were held on a Sunday. Um, his story is told in the, the um, the movie from the 80s, Chariots of Fire. Um, but Eric Little was the son of Scottish missionaries. He was born in China. And in 1925, just a year after those Paris Olympics, he went back to China to be a missionary himself. And other than a couple of trips back to Scotland, that's where he spent the rest of his life. That's where he died. Now, during the Second World War, 
Japan launched this massive invasion into China. And when this happened, pretty much all foreign nationals were considered a threat. And so they were rounded up and they were put into internment camps, which sounds terrible and horrible. And it's what Americans did to the Japanese. You know, there's fear makes you do unreasonable things. And so Eric Little is, is, is imprisoned in this internment camp in 1943. And he died as a prisoner in that camp in 1945. But that's not the whole of his story. Before his death, Winston Churchill had negotiated for his release. He had arranged a prisoner swap so that Eric Little could come home. After two years in prison, Eric Little was free. And when he learned about the prisoner swap, he gave up his freedom so that someone else, so one of his fellow prisoners, could be released instead. He gave up his freedom. And ultimately, he gave up his life so that someone else could be free. He did what he wanted. And what he wanted was to love his neighbor. In Jesus, he was, he was free. That's what it looks like to fulfill the law. That's, that's a picture of what it looks like to live lives that are truly free. When we live lives that are truly free, we're not thinking primarily about ourselves. In Jesus, we're called to live in freedom. And so that means we can't abandon our freedom for rules and regulations and, and efforts to save ourselves. And we can't abuse it through sinful desires and, and treating God's grace like it's a license to sin because it's all been forgiven anyway. If we aren't deeply and fundamentally changed by God's grace, then it's possible that we have not yet received it. I had a, I had a pastor, um, the, the, the church I became a Christian in, um, so I was a teenager, I had a pastor who would say this all the time. He would say, if there's no fruit, check the root. Um, which is great because it rhymes. Um, and, and what does that mean? If there is no fruit of God's grace and love in your life, then you need to check the root. Are you actually rooted in Christ? Are you believing in him? And Paul's actually going to get to that very thing in this letter. He's going to talk about the fruit of the spirit and what does it look like for us to actually be rooted in God's grace and love. If we've been set free by Jesus, if we have received his love for us, his finished work on the cross, then we won't be the same as we were before. If we've received God's grace and love, we will be changed and we will live changed and free lives. If we're set free by love, then all that matters for us now, from this point forward, as those who belong to Christ, all that matters is faith working through love. Please pray with me.